Section 5 of Zigzags of Treachery and Other Stories by Dashiell Hammett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Golden Horseshoe, Part 1 I haven't anything very exciting to offer you this time, Vince Richmond said as we shook hands. I want you to find a man for me, a man who is not a criminal. There was an apology in his voice. The last couple of jobs this lean, gray-faced attorney had thrown my way had run to gunplay and other forms of rioting, and I suppose he thought anything less than that would put me to sleep. It was a time when he might have been right, when I was a young sprout of twenty or so, newly attached to the Continental Detective Agency. But the fifteen years that had slid by since then had dulled my appetite for rough stuff, I don't mean that I shuddered whenever I considered the possibility of some bird taking a poke at me, but I didn't call that day a total loss in which nobody tried to puncture my short, fat carcass. The man I want found, the lawyer went on as we sat down, is an English architect named Norman Ashcraft. He is a man of about thirty-seven, five feet ten inches tall, well-built and fair-skinned, with light hair and blue eyes. Four years ago he was a typical specimen of the clean-cut blonde Britisher. He may not be like that now. Those four years have been rather hard ones for him, I imagine. I want you to find him for Mrs. Ashcraft, his wife. I know your agency's rule against meddling with family affairs, but I can assure you, that no matter how things turn out, there will be no divorce proceedings in which you will be involved. Here is the story. Four years ago, the Ashcrafts were living together in England, in Bristol. It seems that Mrs. Ashcraft is of a very jealous disposition, and he was rather high-strung. Furthermore, he had only what money he earned at his profession— while she had inherited quite a bit from her parents. Ashcroft was rather foolishly sensitive about being the husband of a wealthy woman, was inclined to go out of his way to show that he was not dependent upon her money, that he wouldn't be influenced by it. Foolish, of course, but just the sort of attitude a man of his temperament would assume. One night she accused him of paying too much attention to another woman— they quarreled, and he packed up and left. She was repentant within a week, especially repentant, since she had learned that her suspicion had no foundation outside of her own jealousy, and she tried to find him. But he was gone. It became manifest that he had left England. She had him searched for in Europe, in Canada, in Australia, and in the United States. She succeeded in tracing him from Bristol to New York, and then to Detroit, where he had been arrested and fined for disturbing the peace in a drunken row of some sort. After that, he dropped out of sight until he bobbed up in Seattle ten months later. The attorney hunted through the papers on his desk and found a memorandum. On May 23, 1923, he shot and killed a burglar in his room in a hotel there. The Seattle police seemed to have suspected that there was something funny about the shooting, but had nothing to hold Ashcraft on. The man he killed was undoubtedly a burglar. Then Ashcraft disappeared again, and nothing was heard of him until just about a year ago. Mrs. Ashcraft had advertisements inserted in the personal columns of papers in the principal American cities. One day she received a letter from him from San Francisco. It was a very formal letter, and simply requested her to stop advertising. Although he was through with the name Norman Ashcraft, he wrote, he disliked seeing it published in every newspaper he read. She mailed a letter to him at the general delivery window here, and used another advertisement to tell him about it. He answered it rather caustically. She wrote him again, 
asking him to come home. He refused, though he seemed less bitter toward her. They exchanged several letters, and she learned that he had become a drug addict and that what was left of his pride would not let him return to her until he looked and was at least somewhat like his former self. She persuaded him to accept enough money from her to straighten himself out. She sent him this money each month in care of general delivery here. Meanwhile, she closed up her affairs in England. She had no close relatives to hold her there, and came to San Francisco to be on hand when her husband was ready to return to her. A year has gone. She still sends him money each month. She still waits for him to come back to her. He has repeatedly refused to see her, and his letters are evasive, filled with accounts of the struggle he is having, making headway against the drug one month, slipping back the next. She suspects by now, of course, that he has no intention of ever coming back to her, that he does not intend giving up the drug, that he is simply using her as a source of income. I have urged her to discontinue the monthly allowance for a while. That would at least bring about an interview, I think, and she could learn definitely what to expect but she will not do that. You see, she blames herself for this present condition. She thinks her foolish flare of jealousy is responsible for his plight, and she is afraid to do anything that might either hurt him or induce him to hurt himself further. Her mind is unchangeably made up in that respect. She wants him back, wants him straightened out. But if he will not come then she is content to continue the payments for the rest of his life. But she wants to know what she is to expect. She wants to end this devilish uncertainty in which she has been living. What we want, then, is for you to find Ashcraft. We want to know whether there is any likelihood of his ever becoming a man again, or whether he has gone beyond redemption. There is your job. Find him, learn whatever you can about him, and then, after we know something, we will decide whether it is wiser to force an interview between them in hopes that she will be able to influence him or not. I'll try it, I said. When does Mrs. Ashcraft send him his monthly allowance? On the first of each month. Today is the 28th. That'll give me three days to wind up a job I have on hand. Got a photo of him? Unfortunately, no. In her anger, immediately after the row, Mrs. Ashcraft destroyed everything she had that would remind her of him. But I don't think a photograph would be of any great help at the post office. Without consulting me, Mrs. Ashcraft watched for her husband there on several occasions and did not see him. It is more than likely that he has someone else call for his mail. I got up and reached for my hat. See you around the second of the month, I said, as I left the office. Two. On the afternoon of the first, I went down to the post office and got hold of Lusk, the inspector in charge of the division at the time. I've got a line on a scratcher from up north, I told Lusk who was supposed to be getting his mail at the window. Will you fix it up so I can get a spot on him? Post office inspectors are all tied up with rules and regulations that forbid their giving assistance to private detectives except on certain criminal matters. But a friendly inspector doesn't have to put you through the third degree. You lie to him so that he will have an alibi in case there's a kickback, and whether he thinks you're lying or not doesn't matter. So presently I was downstairs again, loitering within sight of the A to D window, with a clerk at the window instructed to give me the office when Ashcraft's mail was called for. There was no mail for him there at the time. Mrs. Ashcraft's letter would hardly get to the clerk's that afternoon, but I was taking no chances. 
I stayed on the job until the windows closed at 8 o'clock and then went home. At a few minutes after 10 the next morning, I got my action. One of the clerks gave me the signal. A small man in a blue suit and a soft gray hat was walking away from the window with an envelope in his hand. A man of perhaps 40 years, although he looked older. His face was pasty, his feet dragged, and although the clothes were fairly new, they needed brushing and pressing. He came straight to the desk in front of which I stood fiddling with some papers. Out of the tail of my eye, I saw that he had not opened the envelope in his hand, was not going to open it. He took a large envelope from his pocket, and I got just enough of a glimpse of its front to see that it was already stamped and addressed. I twisted my neck out of joint trying to read the address, but failed. He kept the address side against his body, put the letter he had got from the window in it, and licked the flap backwards so that there was no possible way for anybody to see the front of the envelope. Then he rubbed the flap down carefully and turned toward the mailing slots. I went after him. There was nothing to do but to pull the always reliable stumble. I overtook him, stepped close, and faked a fall on the marble floor, bumping into him, grabbing him as if to regain my balance. It went rotten. In the middle of my stunt, my foot really did slip, and we went down on the floor like a pair of wrestlers, with him under me. To botch the trick thoroughly, he fell with the envelope pinned under him. I scrambled up, yanked him to his feet, mumbled an apology, and almost had to push him out of the way to beat him to the envelope that lay face down on the floor. I had to turn it over as I handed it to him in order to get the address. Mr. Edward Bohannon, Golden Horseshoe Cafe, Tijuana, Baja, California, Mexico. I had the address, but I had tipped my mitt. There was no way in God's world for this little man in blue to miss knowing that I had been trying to get that address. I dusted myself off while he put his envelope through the slot. He didn't come back past me, but went on down toward the Mission Street exit. I couldn't let him get away with what he knew. I didn't want Ashcraft tipped off before I got to him. I would have to try another trick as ancient as the one the slippery floor had bungled for me. I set out after the little man again. Just as I reached his side, he turned his head to see if he was being followed. "'Hello, Mickey,' I hailed him. "'How's everything in shy?' "'You got me wrong,' he spoke out of the side of his gray-lipped mouth, not stopping. "'I don't know nothing about shy.' His eyes were pale blue with needlepoint pupils, the eyes of a heroin or morphine user. Quit stalling, I walked along at his side. We had left the building by this time and were going down Mission Street. You fell off the rattler only this morning. He stopped on the sidewalk and faced me. Me? Who do you think I am? You're Mickey Parker. The Dutchman gave us the rap that you were headed here. They got him if you don't already know it. You're cuckoo, he sneered. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. That was nothing. Neither did I. I raised my right hand in my overcoat pocket. Now I'll tell one, I growled at him. And keep your hands away from your clothes or I'll let the guts out of you. He flinched back from my bulging pocket. Hey, listen, brother, he begged. You got me wrong, on the level. My name ain't Mickey Parker. "'and I ain't been in Chai in six years. "'I've been here in Frisco for a solid year, and that's the truth. "'You gotta show me.' "'I can do it,' he exclaimed all eagerness. "'You come down the drag with me, and I'll show you. "'My name's Ryan, and I've been living around the corner here on 6th Street "'for six or eight months.' "'Ryan?' I asked. "'Yes, John Ryan.' "'I chalked that up against him. Of course, there have been Ryan's christened John, but not enough of them to account for the number of times that name appears in criminal records. I don't suppose there are three old-time Yeggs in the country who haven't used the name at least once. It's the John Smith of Yeggdom. This particular John Ryan led me around to a house on 6th Street, where the landlady, a rough-hewn woman of fifty with bare arms that were haired and muscled like the village smithies, assured me that her tenant had, to her positive knowledge, been in San Francisco for months, and that she remembered seeing him at least once a day for a couple of weeks back. If I had really been suspicious that this Ryan was my mythical Mickey Parker from Chicago, I wouldn't have taken the woman's word for it. But as it was, I pretended to be satisfied. That seemed to be all right, then. 
Mr. Ryan had been led astray, had been convinced that I had mistaken him for another crook, and that I was not interested in the Ashcraft letter. I would be safe, reasonably safe, in letting the situation go as it stood. But loose ends worry me, and you can't always count on people doing and thinking what you want. This bird was a hophead, and he had given me a phony-sounding name, so... What do you do for a living? I asked him. I ain't been doing nothing for a couple of months, he pattered, but, but I expect to open a lunch room with a fellow next week. Let's go to your room, I suggested. I want to talk to you. He wasn't enthusiastic, but he took me up. He had two rooms in a kitchen on the third floor. They were dirty, foul-smelling rooms. I dangled a leg from the corner of a table and waved him into a squeaky rocking chair in front of me. His pasty face and dopey eyes were uneasy. Where's Ashcraft? I threw at him. He jerked and then looked at the floor. I don't know what you're talking about, he mumbled. You'd better figure it out, I advised him, or there's a nice cool cell down in the booby hatch that will be wrapped around you. You ain't got nothing on me. What of that? How'd you like to do a thirty or sixty on a vague charge? Vague hell, he snarled, looking at me. I got five hundred smacks in my kick. Does that look like you can vague me? I grinned down at him. You know better than that, Ryan. A pocket full of money will get you nothing in California. You've got no job. You can't show where your money comes from. You're made to order for the vague law. I had this bird figured as a dope peddler. If he was, or was anything else off color that might come to light when it was vagued, the chances were that he would be willing to sell Ashcraft out to save himself. Especially since, so far as I knew, Ashcraft wasn't on the wrong side of the criminal law. If I were you, I went on while he stared at the floor and thought, I'd be a nice, obliging fellow and do my talking now. You're... He twisted sidewise in his chair and one of his hands went behind him. I kicked him out of his chair. The table slipped under me or I would have stretched him. As it was, the foot that I aimed at his jaw took him on the chest and carried him over backward with a rocking chair piled on top of him. I pulled the chair off and took his gun, a cheap nickel-plated thirty-two. Then I went back to my seat on the corner of the table. He had only that one flash of fight in him. He got up, sniveling. I'll tell you, I don't want no trouble, and it ain't nothing to me. I didn't know there was anything wrong. This Ashcraft told me he was just stringing his wife along. He gave me ten bucks a throw to get this letter every month and send it to him in Tijuana. I knowed him here, and when he went south six months ago, he's got a girl down there. I promised I'd do it for him. I knowed it was money. He said it was his alimony, but I didn't know whether there was nothing wrong. What sort of an hombre is this Ashcraft? What's his craft? I don't know. He could be a con man. He's got a good front. He's an Englishman and mostly goes by the name of Ed Bohannon. He hits the hop. I don't use it myself. <laughs> that was a good one. But you know how it is in a burg like this. A man runs into all kinds of people. I don't know nothing about what he's up to. I just send the money every month and get my ten. That was all I could get out of him. He couldn't or wouldn't tell me where Ashcraft had lived in San Francisco or who he had mobbed up with. However, I had learned that Bohannon was Ashcraft and not another go-between, and that was something. Ryan squawked his head off when he found that I was going to vague him anyway. For a moment it looked like I would have to kick him loose from his backbone again. You said you'd spring me if I talked, he wailed. I did not, but if I had, when a gent flashes a rod on me, I figure it cancels any agreement we might have had. Come on. I couldn't afford to let him run around loose until I got in touch with Ashcraft. He would have been sending a telegram before I was three blocks away, and my quarry would be on his merry way to points north, east, south, and west. It was a good hunch I played in nabbing Ryan. When he was fingerprinted at the Hall of Justice, he turned out to be one Fred Rooney, alias Jamoka, a peddler and smuggler who had crushed out of the federal prison at Leavenworth, leaving eight years of a tenor still unserved. "'Will you sew him up for a couple of days?' I asked the captain of the city jail. "'I've got work to do that will go smoother if he can't get any word out for a while.' "'Sure,' the captain promised. "'The federal people won't take him off our hands for two or three days. 
I'll keep a mare tight until then. 3. From the jail, I went up to Vance Richmond's office and turned my news over to him. Ashcraft is getting his mail in Tijuana. He's living down there under the name of Ed Bohannon, and maybe as a woman there. I've just thrown one of his friends, the one who handled the mail in an escaped con, in the cooler. Was that necessary? Richmond asked. We don't want to work any hardships. We're really trying to help Ashcraft, you know. I could have spared this bird, I admitted, but what for? He was all wrong. If Ashcraft can be brought back to his wife, he's better off with some of his shady friends out of the way. If he can't, what's the difference? Anyway, we've got one line on him safely stowed away where we can find it when we want it. The attorney shrugged and reached for the telephone. He called a number. Is Mrs. Ashcraft there? This is Mr. Richmond. No, we haven't exactly found him, but I think we know where he is. Yes, in about fifteen minutes. He put down the telephone and stood up. We'll run up to Mrs. Ashcraft's house and see her. Fifteen minutes later, we were getting out of Richmond's car in Jackson Street near Goff. The house was a three-story white stone building set behind a carefully sodded little lawn with an iron railing around it. Mrs. Ashcraft received us in a drawing room on the second floor. A tall woman of less than thirty, slimly beautiful in a gray dress. Clear was the word that best fits her. It described the blue of her eyes, the pink white of her skin, and the light brown of her hair. Richmond introduced me to her, and then I told her what I had learned, omitting the part about the woman in Tijuana. Nor did I tell her that the chances were her husband was a crook nowadays. Mr. Ashcraft is in Tijuana, I've been told. He left San Francisco about six months ago. His mail is being forwarded to him in care of a cafe down there under the name of Edward Bohannon. Her eyes lighted up happily, but she didn't throw a fit. She wasn't that sort. She addressed the attorney. Shall I go down, or will you? Richmond shook his head. Neither. You certainly shouldn't go, and I cannot. Not at present. I must be in Eureka by the day after tomorrow, and shall have to spend several days there. He turned to me. You'll have to go. You can no doubt handle it better than I could. You will know what to do and how to do it. There are no definite instructions I can give you. Your course will have to depend on Mr. Ashcraft's attitude and condition. Mrs. Ashcraft doesn't wish to force herself on him, but neither does she wish to leave anything undone that might help him. Mrs. Ashcraft held a strong, slender hand out to me. You will do whatever you think wisest. It was partly a question, partly an expression of confidence. I will, I promised. I like this, Mrs. Ashcraft. 4. Tijuana hadn't changed much in the two years I had been away. Still the same six or seven hundred feet of dusty and dingy street running between two almost solid rows of saloons, perhaps thirty-five of them to a row, with dirtier side streets taking care of the dives that couldn't find room on the main street. The automobile that had brought me down from San Diego dumped me into the center of the town early in the afternoon, and the day's business was just getting underway. That is, there were only two or three drunks wandering around among the dogs and loafing Mexicans in the street, although there was already a bustle of potential drunks moving from one saloon to the next. But this was nothing like the crowd that would be here the following week when the season's racing started. In the middle of the next block, I saw a big gilded horseshoe. I went down the street and into the saloon behind the sign. It was a fair sample of the local joint. A bar on your left as you came in, running half the length of the building, with three or four slot machines on one end. Across from the bar, against the right-hand wall, a dance floor that ran from the front wall to a raised platform, where a greasy orchestra was now preparing to go to work. Behind the orchestra was a row of low stalls or booths with open fronts and a table and two benches apiece. Opposite them, in the space between the bar and the rear of the building, a man with a hair lip was shaking pills out of a kino goose. 
It was early in the day, and there were only a few buyers present, so the girls whose business it is to speed the sale of drinks charged down on me in a flock. Buy me a drink? Let's have a little drink. Buy a drink, honey. I shooed them away, no easy job, and caught a bartender's eye. He was a beefy, red-faced Irishman with sorrel hair plastered down in two curls that hid what little forehead he had. I want to see Ed Bohannon, I told him confidentially. He turned blank, fish-green eyes on me. I don't know no Ed Bohannon. Taking out a piece of paper and a pencil, I scribbled, Jamoka is copped, and slid the paper over to the bartender. If a man who says he's Ed Bohannon asks for that, will you give it to him? I guess so. Good, I said. I'll hang around a while. I walked down the room and sat at a table in one of the stalls. A lanky girl who had done something to her hair that made it purple was camped beside me before I had settled into my seat. Buy me a little drink? she asked. The face she made at me was probably meant for a smile. Whatever it was, it beat me. I was afraid she'd do it again, so I surrendered. Yes, I said, and ordered a bottle of beer for myself from the waiter who was already hanging over my shoulder. The beer wasn't bad, for green beer. But at four bits a bottle, it wasn't anything to write home about. This Tijuana happens to be in Mexico, by about a mile. But it's an American town, run by Americans, who sell American artificial booze at American prices. If you know your way around the United States, you can find lots of places, especially near the Canadian line, where good booze can be bought for less than you were soaked for poison in Tijuana. The purple-haired woman at my side downed her shot of whiskey and was opening her mouth to suggest that we have another drink. Hustlers down here don't waste any time at all when a voice spoke from behind me. Cora, Frank wants you. Cora scowled, looking over my shoulder. Then she made that damned face at me again, said, All right, Cupie, will you take care of my friend here? And left me. Cupie slid into the seat beside me. She was a little chunky girl of perhaps eighteen, not a day more than that, just a kid. Her short hair was brown and curly over a round, boyish face with laughing, impudent eyes. Rather a cute little trick. I brought her a drink and got another bottle of beer. What's on your mind? I asked her. Hooch? She grinned at me, a grin that was as boyish as the straight look of her brown eyes. Gallons of it. And besides that? I knew this switching of girls on me hadn't been purposeless. I hear you're looking for a friend of mine, Cupie said. That might be. What friends have you got? Well, there's Ed Bohannon, for one. You know Ed? I shook my head. No, not yet. But you're looking for him? Uh-huh. Maybe I could tell you how to find him. If I knew you were all right. It doesn't make any difference to me, I said carelessly. I have a few more minutes to waste, and if he doesn't show up by then, it's all one to me. She cuddled against my shoulder. What's the racket? Maybe I could get word to Ed. I stuck a cigarette in her mouth, one in my own, and lit them. Let it go, I bluffed. This Ed of yours seems to be as exclusive as all hell. Well, it's no skin off my face. I'll buy you another drink and then trot along. She jumped up. Wait a minute. I'll see if I can get him. What's your name? Parker will do as well as any other, I said, the name I had used on Ryan popping first into my mind. You wait, she called back as she moved toward the back door. I think I can find him. <laughs> I think so, too, I agreed. Ten minutes went by and a man came to my table from the front of the establishment. He was a blonde Englishman of less than forty, with all the marks of the gentleman gone to pot on him. Not altogether on the rocks yet, but you could see evidence of the downhill slide plainly in the dullness of his blue eyes, in the pouches under his eyes, in the blurred lines around his mouth, and the mouth's looseness, and in the grayish tint of his skin. He was still fairly attractive in appearance, Enough of his former wholesomeness remained for that. He sat down facing me across the table. You're looking for me? There was only a hint of the Britisher in his accent. You're Ed Bohannon? He nodded. 
Jamoka was picked up a couple of days ago, I told him, and ought to be riding back to the Kansas big house by now. He got word out for me to give you the rap. He knew I was headed this way. How did they come to get him? His blue eyes were suspicious on my face. Don't know, I said. Maybe they picked him up on a circular. He frowned at the table and traced a meaningless design with a finger in a puddle of beer. Then he looked sharply at me again. Did he tell you anything else? He didn't tell me anything. He got word out to me by somebody's mouthpiece. I didn't see him. You're staying down here a while? Yes, for two or three days, I said. I've got something on the fire. He stood up and smiled and held out his hand. Thanks for the tip, Parker, he said. If you'll take a walk with me, I'll give you something real to drink. I didn't have anything against that. He led me out of the Golden Horseshoe and down a side street to an adobe house set out where the town fringed off into the desert. In the front room, he waved me into a chair and went to the next room. "'What do you fancy?' he called through the door. "'Rye? Gin? Tequila? Scotch?' "'The last one wins,' I interrupted his catalog. He brought in a bottle of black and white, a siphon, and some glasses, and we settled down to drinking. When that bottle was empty, there was another to take its place. We drank and talked, drank and talked, and each of us pretended to be drunker than he really was. But before long, we were both as full as a pair of goats. It was a drinking contest, pure and simple. He was trying to drink me into a pulp, a pulp that would easily give up all of its secrets. And I was trying the same game on him. Neither of us made much progress. Neither he nor I were young enough in the world to blab much when we were drunk that wouldn't have come out if we had been sober. Few grown men do, unless they get to boasting or are very skillfully handled. All that afternoon we faced each other over the table in the center of the room, drank, and entertained each other. You know, he was saying somewhere along toward dark, I've been a damn ass. Got a wife the nicest woman in the world, wants me to come back to her and all that sort of thing, yet I hang around here, lapping up this stuff, hitting the pipe, when I could be somebody. Ach, architect, you understand? Good one, too. But I got in rut, got mixed up with these people. I can't seem to break away. Going to, though. No spoofing. Going back to little wife, nicest woman in the world. Don't you say anything to Cupie. She'd raise hell if she knew I was going to shake her. Nice girl, Cupie, but tough. Stick a blooming knife in me. Good job, too. But I'm going back to wife. Breaking away from pipe and everything. Look at me. Do I look like a hophead? Course not. Curing myself, that's why. I'll show you. Take a smoke now. Show you I can take it or leave it alone. Pulling himself dizzily up off his chair, he wandered into the next room, bawling a song at the top of his voice. A dim bermot with a quarter-tone strum, a bubbling of Max with her cove, a bingo fin and a crocodon drum, a waiting for... He came staggering into the room again, carrying an elaborate opium layout, all silver and ebony, on a silver tray. He put it on the table and flourished a pipe at me. Have a little rear on me, Parker. I told him I'd stick to the scotch. Give you a shot of sea if you'd rather have it, he invited me. I declined the cocaine, so he sprawled himself comfortably on the floor beside the table, rolled and cooked a pill, and our party went on, with him smoking his hop and me punishing the liquor, each of us still talking for the other's benefit and trying to get the other to talk for our own. I was holding down a lovely package by the time Cupie came in at midnight. "'Looks like you folks are enjoying yourselves,' she laughed, leaning down to kiss the Englishman's rumpled hair as she stepped over him. She perched herself on the table and reached for the scotch. "'Everything's lovely,' I assured her. Well, probably I didn't say it that clear. I was fighting a battle with myself just about then. I had an idea that I wanted to dance. 
down in Yucatan four or five months before, hunting for a lad who had gone wrong by the bank that had employed him. I'd seen some natives dance the Nagal, and that Nagal dance was the one thing in the world I wanted to do just then. I was carrying a beautiful bun, but I knew if I sat still, as I had been sitting all afternoon, I could keep my cargo in hand while I wasn't going to take much moving around and knock me over. I don't remember whether I finally conquered the desire to dance or not. I remember Cupie sitting on the table, grinning her boy's grin at me and saying, You ought to stay oiled all the time, Shorty. It improves you. I don't know whether I made any answer to that or not. Shortly afterward, I know, I spread myself beside the Englishman on the floor and went to sleep. 5. The next two days were pretty much like the first one. Ashcraft and I were together 24 hours each of the days, and usually the girl was with us. And the only time we weren't drinking was when we were sleeping off what we had been drinking. We spent most of those three days in either the adobe house or the golden horseshoe. But we found time to take in most of the other joints in town now and then. I had only a hazy idea of some of the things that went on around me, though I don't think I missed anything entirely. On the second day, someone added a first name to the alias that I had given the girl, and thereafter I was painless Parker to Tijuana, and still am to some of them. I don't know who christened me or why. Ashcraft and I were as thick as thieves on the surface, but neither of us ever lost his distrust of the other, no matter how drunk we got, and we got plenty drunk. He went up against his mud pipe regularly. I don't think the girl used the stuff, but she had a pretty capacity for hard liquor. I would go to sleep not knowing whether I was going to wake up or not, but I had nothing on me to give me away, so I figured that I was safe unless I talked myself into a jam. I didn't worry much. Bedtime usually caught me in a state that made worry impossible. Three days of this, and then, sobering up, I was riding back to San Francisco, making a list of what I knew and guessed about Norman Ashcraft, alias Ed Bohannon. The list went something like this. 1. He suspected, if he didn't know, that I had come down to see him on his wife's account. He had been too smooth and had entertained me too well for me to doubt that. 2. He apparently had decided to return to his wife, though there was no guarantee that he would actually do so. 3. He was not incurably addicted to drugs. He merely smoked opium, and regardless of what the Sunday supplements say, an opium smoker is little, if any, worse off than a tobacco smoker. 4. He might pull himself together under his wife's influence, but it was doubtful. Physically, he hadn't gone to the dogs, but he had had his taste of the gutter and seemed to like it. 5. The girl Cupie was crazily in love with him. While well, he liked her, but wasn't turning himself inside out over her, a good night's sleep on the train between Los Angeles and San Francisco set me down on the 3rd and Townsend Street station with nearly normal head and stomach and not too many kinks in my nerves. I put away a breakfast that was composed of more food than I had eaten in three days and went up to Vance Richmond's office. Mr. Richmond is still in Eureka, his stenographer told me. I don't expect him back until the first of the week. Can you get him on the phone for me? She could and did. Without mentioning any names, I told the attorney what I knew and guessed. I see, he said. Suppose you go out to Mrs. A.'s house and tell her. I will write her tonight, and I probably shall be back in the city by the day after tomorrow. I think we can safely delay action until then. I caught a streetcar, transferred to Venice Avenue, and went out to Mrs. Ashcraft's house. Nothing happened when I rang the bell. I rang it several times before I noticed that there were two morning newspapers in the vestibule. I looked at the dates, this morning's and yesterday morning's. An old man in faded overalls was watering the lawn next door. Do you know if the people who live here have gone away? I called to him. I don't guess so. The back door's open. I've seen this morning. He returned his attention to his hose, and then stopped to scratch his chin. "'They may have gone,' he said slowly. "'Come to think of it, I ain't seen any of them for—' 
I don't remember seeing any of them yesterday. I left the front steps and went around the house, climbed the low fence and back, and went up the back steps. The kitchen door stood about a foot apart. Nobody was visible in the kitchen, but there was a sound of running water. I knocked on the door with my knuckles, loudly. There was no answering sound. I pushed the door open and went in. The sound of water came from the sink. I looked in the sink. Under a thin stream of water running from one of the faucets lay a carving knife with nearly a foot of keen blade. The knife was clean, but the back of the porcelain sink, where water had splashed with only small scattered drops, was freckled with red-brown spots. I scraped one of them with a fingernail, dried blood. Except for the sink, I could see nothing out of order in the kitchen. I opened a pantry door. Everything seemed all right there. Across the room, another door led to the front of the house. I opened the door and went into a passageway. Not enough light came from the kitchen to illuminate the passageway. I fumbled in the dusk for the light button that I knew should be there. I stepped on something soft. Pulling my foot back, I felt in my pocket for matches and struck one. In front of me, his head and shoulders on the floor, his hips and legs on the lower steps of a flight of stairs, lay a Filipino boy in his underclothes. He was dead. One eye was cut, and his throat was gashed straight across, close up under his chin. I could see the killing without even shutting my eyes. At the top of the stairs, the killer's left hand, dashing into the Filipino's face, thumbnail gouging into eye, pushing the brown face back, tightening the brown throat for the knife's edge, the slash, and the shove down the stairs. The light from my second match showed me the button. I clicked on the lights, buttoned my coat, and went up the steps. Dried blood darkened them here and there, and at the second floor landing the wallpaper was stained with a big blot. At the head of the stairs I found another light button and pressed it. I walked down the hall, poked my head into two rooms that seemed in order, and then turned a corner and pulled up with a jerk, barely in time to miss stumbling over a woman who lay there. She was huddled on the floor, face down, with knees drawn up under her, and both hands clasped to her stomach. She wore a nightgown, and her hair was in a braid down her back. I put a finger on the back of her neck, stone cold. Kneeling on the floor, to avoid the necessity of turning her over, I looked at her face. She was the maid who had admitted Richmond and me four days ago. I stood up again and looked around. The maid's head was almost touching a closed door. I stepped around her and pushed the door open. A bedroom, and not the maid's. It was an expensively dainty bedroom in cream and gray, with French prints on the walls. Nothing in the room was disarranged except the bed. The bedclothes were rumpled and tangled and piled high in the center of the bed in a pile that was too large. Leaning over the bed, I began to draw the covers off. The second piece came away stained with blood. I yanked the rest off. Mrs. Ashcraft was dead there. Her body was drawn up in a little heap, from which her head hung crookedly, dangling from a neck that had been cut clean through to the bone. Her face was marked with four deep scratches from temple to chin. One sleeve had been torn from the jacket of her blue silk pajamas. Bedding and pajamas were soggy with the blood that the clothing piled over her had kept from drying. I put the blanket over her again, edged past the dead woman in the hall, and went down the front stairs, switching on more lights, hunting for the telephone. Near the foot of the stairs I found it. I called the police detective bureau first, and then Vance Richmond's office. Get word to Mr. Richmond that Mrs. Ashcraft has been murdered, I told his stenographer. I'm at her house, and he can get in touch with me here any time during the next two or three hours. Then I went out the front door and sat on the top step, smoking a cigarette while I waited for the police. I felt rotten. I've seen dead people in larger quantities than three in my time, and I've seen some that were hacked up pretty badly. But this thing had fallen on me while my nerves were ragged from three days of boozing. The police automobile swung around the corner and began disgorging men before I had finished my first cigarette. Ogar, the detective sergeant in charge of the homicide detail, was the first man up the steps. 
"'Hello,' he greeted me. "'What have you got hold of this time?' I was glad to see him. This squat, bullet-headed sergeant is as good a man as the department has, and he and I have always been lucky when we tied up together. "'I found three bodies in there before I quit looking,' I told him as I let him indoors. "'Maybe a regular detective like you, with a badge and everything, can find more.' "'You didn't do bad. For a lad,' he said. "'My wooziness had passed. I was eager to get to work. "'These people lying dead around the house were merely counters in a game again. "'Or almost. "'I remembered the feel of Mrs. Ashcraft's slim hand in mine. "'But I stuck that memory in the back of my mind. "'You hear now and then of detectives who have not become callous?' who have not lost what you might call the human touch. I always feel sorry for them, and wonder why they didn't chuck their jobs and find another line of work that wouldn't be so hard on their emotions. A sleuth who doesn't grow a tough shell is in for a gay life, day in and out, poking his nose into one kind of woe or another. I showed the Filipino to Algar first, and then the two women. We didn't find any more. Detail work occupied all of us, Ogar, the eight men under him, and me, for the next few hours. The house had to be gone over from roof to cellar. The neighbors had to be grilled. The employment agencies through which the servants had been hired had to be examined. Relatives and friends of the Filipino and the maid had to be traced and questioned. Newsboys, mail carriers, grocers' deliverymen, laundrymen had to be found, questioned, and when necessary, investigated. When the bulk of the reports were in, Ogar and I sneaked away from the others, especially away from the newspaper men who were all over the place by now, and locked ourselves in the library. Night before last, huh? Wednesday night? Ogar grunted when we were comfortable in a couple of leather chairs, burning tobacco. I nodded. The report of the doctor who had examined the bodies, the presence of the two newspapers in the vestibule, and the fact that neither neighbor, grocer, nor butcher had seen any of them since Wednesday combined to make Wednesday night or early Thursday morning the correct date. I'd say the killer cracked the back door, Ogar went on, staring at the ceiling through smoke, picked up the carving knife in the kitchen, and went upstairs. Maybe went straight to Mrs. Ashcroft's room. Maybe not. But after a bit he went in there, the torn sleeve and the scratches on her face mean that there was a tussle. The Filipino and the maid heard the noise, heard her scream, maybe, and rushed to her room to find out what was the matter. The maid most likely got there just as the killer was coming out, and got hers. I guess the Filipino saw him then, and ran. The killer caught him at the head of the back stairs, and finished him. Then he went down to the kitchen, washed his hands, dropped the knife, and blue. So far, so good, I agreed. But I notice you skipped lightly over the question of who he was and why he killed. He pushed his hat back and scratched his bullet head. Don't crowd me, he rumbled. I'll get around to that. There seem to be just three guesses to take your pick from. We know that nobody else lived in the house outside of the three that were killed, so the killer was either a maniac who did the job for the fun of it, a burglar who was discovered and ran wild, or somebody who had a reason for bumping off Mrs. Ashcraft, and then had to kill the two servants when they discovered him. Taking the knife from the kitchen would make the burglar guess look like a bum one. And besides, we're pretty sure nothing was stolen. A good prowler would bring his own weapon with him if he wanted one. But the hell of it is that there are a lot of bum prowlers in the world, half-wits who would be likely to pick up a knife in the kitchen, go to pieces when the house woke up, slash everybody in sight, and then beat it without turning anything over. So it could have been a prowler. But my personal guess is that the job was done by somebody who wanted to wipe out Mrs. Ashcraft. Not so bad, I applauded. Now listen to this. Mrs. Ashcraft has a husband in Tijuana, a mild sort of hophead who is mixed up with a bunch of thugs. She was trying to persuade him to come back to her. 
He has a girl down there who is young, goofy over him, and a bad actor. One tough youngster. He was planning to run out on the girl and come back home. So, Ogar said softly. But, I continued, I was with both him and the girl in Tijuana night before last, when this killing was done. So? A knock on the door interrupted our talk. It was a policeman to tell me that I was wanted on the phone. I went down to the first floor, and Vance Richmond's voice came over the wire. What is it? Mrs. Henry delivered your message, but she couldn't give me any details. I told him the whole thing. I leave for the city tonight, he said when I had finished. You go ahead and do whatever you want. You're to have a free hand. Right, I replied. I'll probably be out of town when you get back. You can reach me through the agency if you want to get in touch with me. I'm going to wire Ashcraft to come up. In your name. After Richmond had hung up, I called the city jail and asked the captain if John Ryan, alias Fred Rooney, alias Jamoka, was still there. No. Federal officers left for Leavenworth with him and two other prisoners yesterday morning. Up in the library again, I told O'Gar hurriedly, I'm catching the evening train south, betting my marbles that the job was made in Tijuana. I'm wiring Ashcraft to come up. I want to get him away from the Mexican town for a day or two, and if he's up here, you can keep an eye on him. I'll give you a description of him, and you can pick him up at Vance Richmond's office. He'll probably connect there first thing. Half an hour of the little time I had left I spent writing and sending three telegrams. The first was to Ashcraft. Edward Bohannon, Golden Horseshoe Cafe, Tijuana, Mexico. Mrs. Ashcraft is dead. Can you come immediately? Vance Richmond. The other two were in code. One went to the Continental Detective Agency's Kansas City branch, asking that an operative be sent to Leavenworth to question Jamoka. The other requested the Los Angeles branch to have a man meet me in San Diego the next day. Then I dashed out to my rooms for a bag full of clean clothes and went to sleep riding south again. End of The Golden Horseshoe, Part 1